So great to have our children and youth choirs singing for us again. It's been a long time. The author of that last song is Charles Albert Tinley. Uh, he's often considered the grandfather of black gospel music or black hymnody. Um, he was the son of a mother who was a free woman and a father who was enslaved. He taught himself to read by picking newspapers up, uh, scraps of newspaper up off the road or out of the garbage. He went on to become a renowned poet, writer, theologian, and social activist. Scholars say that his hymns were not just otherworldly, but they were addressed to helping the oppressed survive this world. He was born of a marriage between slavery and freedom, just like America itself, born of an incomprehensible marriage between slavery and freedom. So I, I want to begin this morning with a little story about a father who explained that his daughter just walked into the living room the other day and said, Dad, cancel my allowance immediately. Rent my room out, throw out all my clothes out the window, take my TV and my iPhone and my iPad and my laptop. Please take all my jewelry to the Salvation Army and then sell my new car, take my front door key away from me and throw me out of the house. Then disown me and never talk to me again. And don't forget to write me out of your will and leave my share to my brother. Well, she didn't put it quite like that. She actually said, Dad, this is my new boyfriend. He's rooting for the Philadelphia Eagles in the Super Bowl. <laughs> now, I know how extreme that sounds. But people are extreme these days, and our divisions are extreme these days. People will become divided almost over almost anything and everything. So let's begin Black History Month by examining the power of the stories we tell and how that they can either unite us or they can divide us. Do you ever notice how stories can be like a spell? They can cast a spell over people, sort of put us in a trance. The, the story that you're beautiful or you're ugly, told by the right person, can put you in a trance that can last a lifetime. You're smart or you're dumb or you're superior or inferior. These words can conjure a spell or an incantation. The origin of the word spell is story, the gospel means the good spell, or the good story, or the good news. But not all spells are good. And much of America has been in a trance for a long time. I hope this message can be like a kiss that can break the spell that keeps us fractured. America has as its, at its roots in its founding story a, a, a story that is even more inspiring than the one that we all learned in kindergarten through 12th grade. That heroic story 
of American origin that's been reinforced over and over for all of us by Hollywood movies. That story that cast the original spell. Now, as we sit here, we are in a national battle over the American story. Some people think that if we teach the true and often sordid history of our country's origin, that we will be teaching our children to hate America. But I want you to buckle your seatbelt and be careful because it's possible that along the way there could be some shifting of things in the overhead bin. First, I want to share with you that one time a woman asked me a question that I think only could be asked to a Unitarian minister living in Oklahoma. (laughs) She asked me, does your church teach that God is involved in human history? It's not the kind of question that most people get asked. I said, well, we don't all believe in God or even have the same idea about what God is. In my church, I explained, but historically, People in our tradition have seen the divine in the world in movements of freedom. What does that mean? She inquired. Well, when the Jews were trying to escape slavery, was God on the side of the Jews or on the side of the Pharaoh? Well, God was on the side of the Jews. Exactly. And when the Romans were persecuting the early Christians and not allowing them to practice their religion was God on the side of the Romans or on the side of those early Christians, the Christians, she said. Well, when the Pope was persecuting scientists like Galileo and Copernicus and trying to deny scientific freedom because it disagreed with religious doctrine was God on the side of the Pope or on the side of the scientists. She seemed a little confused by this question. (laughs) We would say that God was on the side of the scientists and scientific freedom over religious persecution. And during American slavery, we don't think that God was speaking through the white Christian clergy who were preaching that African people were less than human. Once again, God... And, or you could say the movement for life's goodness was with the slaves yearning to be free. Today we might say that God or life's goodness is not with the religious mullahs in Iran, but with the women fighting for their freedom and equality. You see, sometimes God might be seen inside of religious movements, but other times it might be seen in those working against a religious movement. The point is that we would say that God has no religion. God is found on the side of freedom, wherever it is trying to unfold in history. Now, with that in mind, I want us to look at American history this morning. America was founded on an irreconcilable marriage of freedom and slavery. The idea that all men are created equal was walking hand in hand with the fact that some men were not considered equal. So America began with a notorious and disgraceful contradiction at its origin. The country was horrific for some and hopeful for others. For centuries, America has focused telling our history and our national identity has been wrapped around certain events that we deem triumphant and hopeful. The War of Independence, the extraordinary statesmen we call our founding fathers, and the pioneering spirit that expanded our nation to the West. Heroes, one and all, who established the land of the free and the home of the brave. And any mention of events that complicate the glory of that story have been seen as unpatriotic. 
But I want to join my voice to others who argue that this is a false choice. Our unity and national pride does not require allegiance to a national myth. Because the actual history, with all of its atrocities and triumphs, is an even more inspiring story. Hear me out. Because we are in a battle over how to tell the history of this nation. And whether we protect the myth of European-American exceptionalism or instead make room for a messier but much more inclusive story. This will determine the future of our multiracial democracy. Now, it's not only obnoxious when some politician or bigot tells an African-American who is protesting some aspect of American life to go back to Africa if they don't like it here. It's ahistorical. Because the truth is that there were Africans here building up this land before the Mayflower ever arrived. And most African Americans trace their heritage in this country many generations before most European immigrants ever arrived. So in most cases, African Americans were here first and longer and have much more, uh, as much if not more, of a claim to this land and this nation as anyone. In fact, let's consider the notion that Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. It sounds like Africans in America were powerless and impotent in their own emancipation. But a more accurate version is not so much that Lincoln freed the slaves as it is that Africans in America saved Lincoln's war and the Union. Historian Stephen Mintz writes, By early 1863, voluntary enlistment in the, Un- in the Union Army had fallen so much that the federal government instituted an unpopular military draft. Think about Putin in Russia right now. You know, this draft, not real popular. And so they decided, Lincoln, to to enroll blacks as well as white troops for the first time. He goes on to say, the historian, that it was the availability of large numbers of African-American soldiers that allowed President Lincoln to resist demands for a negotiated peace that might have included the retention of slavery in the United States and the end of the union as we know it. Altogether, 186,000 black soldiers served in the Union Army and 29,000 served in the Navy, accounting for nearly 10% of the Union forces and three-fifths of all black soldiers were former slaves. Now here in Oklahoma, we had the Battle of Honey Springs in 1863. Afterwards, the Union general named Blunt wrote, I never saw such fighting as was done by the Negro regiment. The question that Negroes will fight is settled. Besides, they make better soldiers in every respect than any troops I have ever had under my command. And this is a picture of the actual troops from that regiment. Just imagine the impact on our national identity if we taught the true story of the Civil War and explained that we likely would not have the Union of the United States of America as we know it without the decisive and heroic contributions of freed and enslaved Africans. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, this doesn't make me want to hate America. In fact, it makes me want to love America even more. I find it more inspiring than the European centered version of our history. It's important to keep in mind that this experiment in multiracial democracy is really pretty young. I mean, this grand experiment in self-government, of the people, by the people, for the people, 
was not a multiracial democracy in the first century after independence due to slavery. And then it still wasn't for another century after emancipation due to Jim Crow voter suppression for another 100 years. So America has only begun to attempt to become a multiracial democracy of the people, by the people, for all the people since 1965. In the lifetime of more than half of us here in the sanctuary this morning. And the only reason that we even came to the point in 1965 to be willing to be a multiracial democracy or to try our best was because of the leadership of outstanding African-Americans, such as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, who held a birthday this week, A. Philip Randolph, Whitney Young, Ella Baker, Medgar Evers, Fannie Lou Hamer, Bayard Rustin, Malcolm X, John Lewis, Dorothy Haight, and others, who of course were building on the work of generations of other courageous and brilliant black leaders, such as Ida B. Wells, and Frederick Douglass, and W.E.B. Du Bois, and Booker T. Washington, and countless others. But this isn't just about the leaders. They only succeeded because of the heroic mobilization of thousands of everyday unsung African Americans who stood up, sat in, marched, boycotted, strategized, politicked, and pushed America to live up to its claims of equality and its promise of justice for all. There would be no America as we know it without the extraordinary contributions of Africans and African Americans. And I haven't even mentioned that the greatest economy that the world has ever known was built on the uncompensated labor of millions of Africans here in America. There is no American history that is not also black history. There is no America without black people. The incredibly inspiring story of America is not just the narrow story of some brilliant European men who forged a philosophical democracy and are responsible for a rare human achievement. It is also the story of an unbelievable struggle and a triumph of humanity over oppression. A triumph that has given us and the world the real possibility of a unity and an equality unparalleled in human history. We have a long way to go. And there are folks trying to roll back the progress as we speak. But they're not going to win. Because they're trying to make an argument that history is a fixed thing that was written by historians a long time ago and it is as if they got it right, so right, once and for all, that nothing new that we could learn can change that. But that was an overly simplistic story that excluded the experiences of a major segments of our population, such as women, laborers, enslaved people, non-European immigrants, native peoples, and many others. It was the history as recorded by the elite ruling classes, and it offers the story of a glorious past as seen through their eyes. As a nation, we are currently plagued by pervasive inequality and racial injustice, and we are intensely divided right now. And we need a story that can more accurately explain how we got here. Because the more historically accurate story is not that we have fallen from our former greatness due to the inclusion of more people into our national body. It is that we are moving toward greatness as a multiracial democracy for the first time because of the inclusion of more people into our national story. The story of the glorious past 
is a myth and a partial truth that we have been told and sold. We need a new, more honest story. An important part of that story is the critical contributions of Africans and African Americans who surmounted immense oppression and violence and systemic injustice and did so despite a powerful national consensus that said that people of African descent were inferior. And they did so under laws that sought to reinforce that, that perceived inferiority. And nevertheless, black people have shaped the very character of this nation and its culture in some of the most distinctive and important ways. This renewed American story takes slavery and the many forms of oppression and it moves them from the margins to the very center of the story of American achievement. Talk about achievement against all odds. Talk about grace under pressure. Talk about dignity in the face of inhumanity. Talk about love as a response to cruelty. Black history is one of the most inspiring parts of the American story. If we continue to leave it out and give it short shrift, we are harming our own chances at building a nation that can offer equality and justice for all. Friends, it should be no surprise that a nation that was founded on an irreconcilable, irreconcilable, help me out here, irreconcilable, thank you, contradiction, that word, would eventually find itself where we are right now in a battle over how to tell the story. The question is, will we embrace all of who we are and achieve all of what we can be? Or will we try to preserve a patriotic myth that no longer serves us? And I have a suggestion this morning. When in doubt, follow the movement of freedom. Amen. Amen.